standing by while I'm walking his pain. Mr. Lee. But, uh, for the most part, the kids are pretty good today. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Lee. You know, how you do things oftentimes is very important. And it's amazing how the way something is done sets the tone. And the way we dismiss kids' church, he's going to have a rough one today because of what I just did there. My mistake. I should have made eye contact with him and waited until he was at the back door and then dismissed the kids. When they get there first, I don't know what it is, but there's something about setting an atmosphere. And it's important for us as well. You know, uh, last week Brother Lee put a note in the church bulletin just about the importance of really coming to church prepared to worship God and being on purpose, being on purpose on time. And I thought that was a little sneaky of him on Time Change Sunday to write a note about how important it is to be on time so that it's not a distraction in the worship service and so forth. But regardless of that, it really does make a difference, doesn't it? Just the way that the way that we do something, the manner of how we do something. You know, sometimes as believers, we get more into how something is done than the reason why it's done, and that's out of balance. That's not right either. But it, we do as believers need to focus on doing things in a way that creates really the perfect atmosphere for God to work. And so hopefully we'll have that here this morning as we prepare to read the text of the scripture that we're going to be in this morning. And if you would just focus as we look at our text, but just focus on while we're reading the text, asking God if he would speak to you. After we read our text, we'll open in prayer. But if you would just help with that, because we really want the Lord to work here today. It would be a tragedy, wouldn't it? If you've invested the time out of your life, which is very, very limited, in being here today for God to speak to you, it would be too bad if God didn't have the chance to do that, wouldn't it? And so let's let's focus on that as we begin uh, reading our text. We're going to look at verse 14 in Matthew chapter 12 today. I'll look at uh, a couple of very, very foundational truths about our Savior Jesus. The Bible says, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, him being Jesus, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled, verse 17, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, and whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Let's read that last verse one more time, shall we? And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. We'll pray. Father, please help us as we both study and apply the Scripture today and as it's preached. God, I pray that simple truth about who Jesus is would not be overlooked by us, but rather instead would have a profound effect in our hearts 
to affect us to know our Savior Jesus more. And God, as we strive to be like Him, to know how we ought to live. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we preach our text this morning, I do want to take a little bit of time and just get our focus on Jesus. It would be too bad, wouldn't it, if you left this place here today with a good or a bad impression of the pastor, but you didn't have any impression at all of Jesus. That would be a shame, actually, wouldn't it? Now, I hope you don't leave with a bad impression of me today, but really, uh, that isn't so important, actually, at all, I mean, if you think about it. Uh, it really doesn't matter what you think about any of us here today. It matters who Jesus is. And it matters that Jesus Christ is lifted up. And so we really want that to be. And I'll be quite frank with you, today it would disturb me if you left with too favorable of an impression of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church or of any person in Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church because that would mean that Jesus really didn't make much of an impression. And so we do want to impress you with Jesus here today if we could. First of all, I uh, want to just talk about who Jesus is. Jesus is pre-existent God. He is God. He existed before creation. And when the Bible talks about uh, who it is that threw out the waters in a garment who made the earth, Jesus is God the Creator. He is the one who physically spoke the world into existence and He is that part of the Godhead that is responsible for creation. Jesus is, and, and Jesus is God. And as God, He is, for lack of a better term, He owns everything. Everything belongs to Him. We are His creation. Sometimes people that don't know Jesus personally as God, or sometimes people who do, misunderstandingly make a statement like, we're all God's children. Well, no, we all are God's creation. But we're not His children. See, individuals who have not received Jesus as their Savior are actually God's enemies. And enemies are not God's children. Uh, but we are God's belonging to Him. That is, we God has the right to judge every person because we are His whether we acknowledge Him or not. Listen, you can think, you can have the notion that as long as I don't acknowledge Jesus or as long as I don't acknowledge God, then He does not have jurisdiction in my life. He can't judge me. He can't do anything. No, my friend, God is your judge. He is your God. But Jesus is not necessarily your Savior. You see the difference or the distinction between the two. And Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the one who was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 when the first man sinned. He is the one who was going to be born of the seed of a woman. That's a very, very distinct, clear uh, allusion to the fact that Christ would be born of a virgin. Genesis 3, 15 and 16. So Jesus is the one who is the seed of promise. He's the one that every generation from the time that the first man sinned look forward to coming as a Savior. He is literally the one that every one of the prophets were prophesying concerning. And we'll actually see that today. But Jesus, my friend, is the hope of the entire world. And anyone who has looked to God to find forgiveness of sin throughout the ages has looked to Jesus. To, in the past, look to what Jesus Christ would do and in Jesus' day, look to Him for what He was doing. And in our day, look to Him for what He had done. Specifically, Jesus came the first time, the Bible says, to become sin for us or to die for sin. He's a perfect Son of God. He's the only individual recorded in the history of the earth that never sinned. And yet He died for more sin than anyone's ever committed because He died, the Bible says, for the sins of the whole world. And so Jesus is God... Jesus is God's Son, and Jesus is uh, Jesus came as a man, but is the only one who never sinned and yet died for sin. And that becomes very, very practical and very personal when you take it to the cross of Jesus. See, Jesus died on the cross specifically for your sin and for mine. And that makes it very, very personal because the fact is, is that if you were to deal with the reality of of your sin and deal with the reality that you're not okay with God dismissing someone else's sin. Don't play that silly game because you won't be honest when you're playing it. And if you think that's what you're uh, playing or the, you think that's what you think or believe, uh, you'll be the only one that buys into that. You know, I've met a lot of people that say, God shouldn't judge sin. God should just forgive 
He should just be able to not judge the wicked. And yet that same person is not okay with God forgiving sin. I've never met someone who thinks that a person who has done indescribable, terrible things ought to just be forgiven. They think that person ought to be judged by God. They just simply think that their sin or uh, their specific sin ought not to be uh, a big deal to God. The fact of the matter is you can't have it both ways. Either God is going to be a righteous judge who is going to destroy the wicked, who is going to judge sin, and uh, if He does that, then we all come under that category. We're all judged equally and fairly by God. Or God doesn't judge sin at all. My friend, God does judge sin. He is a right and righteous judge just as you want Him to be, just as you need Him to be. The problem with God judging sin is that if He were to judge the sinners in this room and give us what we fairly deserved, we'd all be condemned. And sin has a great penalty and great weight with God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so every one of us would have a separation by death sentence from God. And if your death sentence from God is separation, my friend, it's not separation into paradise or separation into heaven or separation into some ambiguous place. It's separation into a place of judgment called hell and it's a place of eternal separation. You know in your heart that that's true. And if you were to study the Scripture carefully, you'd see that's very true. Matter of fact, last week we looked at what the Bible said about hell. We looked at the reality of hell and the descriptions of it. And we won't review that this week, but I think that that message should be online if you'd like to listen to it to give yourself a little context for this week as we look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, Jesus took, God's, took our judgment. He died for our sin so that you and I, simply for receiving the free gift of eternal life, calling out to God and saying, God, I deserve sin, I deserve death, I deserve judgment, but Jesus died in my place, and God, I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus is. I'm looking to the cross of Jesus Christ and Christ alone, and I'm trusting you for my salvation. My friend, God will give you the free gift of eternal life. And that's just the beginning. It's actually just the beginning. Listen, after that, then we add to our faith. And we add to, those, to it all these things. And you know one of the things that will help you in adding to your faith is having an example. There's not a better human example than our Savior Jesus Christ. And I really appreciate the perspective of the, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's perspective, as he presents Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. It's a wonderful thing to see that He is the King of the Jews and that He came as the Son of Man because it's something relatable for us. You say, Pastor, I can't relate to being sinless. No, you cannot. <laughs> Neither can I. But my friend, Jesus was God and He set the example for us. Do you recognize that in His entire ministry, everything Jesus did, He did by the power of the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit that lived in Him, instead of His own power? He literally set aside His power as God and by choice worked with everything that we have. The difference being that Christ never sinned. And he died for sin that he had not committed. Now, I have not said this to you yet this morning, but we would be remiss to leave without making it abundantly clear. God loves you very much. God loves you very much. I don't know what your individual circumstances are, the way that you felt this morning when you woke up, or the way that you feel when you come here. But there are a lot of people in this world that feel as though they're not loved. They feel as though they're not loved by individuals. They feel that they're not loved sometimes by God Himself. And my friend, there's no greater evidence that could be offered that God loves you very much than that Jesus Christ died in your place. Do you realize who Jesus is? He's God. He's God's sinless Son. Do you realize who you are and who I am? We're sinners who deserve God's judgment, and yet God gave His sinless, perfect Son for a sacrifice in our place, and that's the greatest demonstration of love that could ever have been offered, is the love of God literally laying His own life down so that we could have forgiveness. If you're here today and you haven't found forgiveness, my friend, you won't be able to blame it on God. You won't be able to say, God, I just couldn't reconcile who you were. My friend, I'll tell you who God is. God is love. And He loves you so much that rather than destroying you in hell, He judged His own Son in your place. He's a God who's fair, who's judicious, who's right and righteous. There's no problem with God. 
But if you don't receive Jesus Christ, my friend, it will not be because God does not love you, and it will not be because God did not do everything necessary in order for you to be reconciled with Him. God loves you, and He wants you to have a relationship with you with Him. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. It's a great thing, isn't it, to be loved by God? By the way, we love you too, but we love you because of Christ's love. In other words, we are responding uh, to His love. It's amazing to me that God would love a sinner. It's amazing. God would love me when I'm a sinner. But He does. Friend, if that isn't good enough for you, there's something wrong with the way that you think. That ought to be enough for anybody. To be loved by God. Now let's look at our text today. And to bring ourselves into our context, we're in a period or a portion of this Scripture where Jesus is being described by uh, Matthew and he is, he is explaining how that Jesus' ministry was under attack. He's explaining how he was received by the Pharisees. And, and here we see a couple of incidents of things that happened on the Sabbath day. And in verse 1 of chapter 12, the Bible says, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, Thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger, and they that were with him? And you know the story. You remember about how David went into uh, the, went to the temple and he asked for the showbread, which was really just for the priest. It wasn't for just anyone to eat. And yet, it seems that God approved of, well, it doesn't just seem, Jesus used it as an illustration that God allowed David and his men, because of their need, to eat the showbread that was supposed to be for the priest. And so uh, Jesus is using an example here that illustrates, of course, that the Sabbath is made for man. Man is not made for the Sabbath. And I'm not undermining or trying to cut, uh, or not, not trying to say anything uh, about the Sabbath being unnecessary. See, what are the Pharisees trying to do? They're trying to find fault with Jesus. They're trying to find a reason to validate their unbelief. They don't want Jesus for their Savior, and so they're trying to find a reason that they can look at Jesus and validate their unbelief. Now friend, let me just, uh, just by quick application, just warn you, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, I can tell when somebody's on the, on the rampage, if you want to say it that way. I can tell when somebody's out of fellowship with the Lord, and they're actually looking to find fault. Uh, some, usually they, they, uh, they miss about five times before they actually find something legitimately that is faulty about a person. But people that you can tell that they want to get away from fellowship with the Lord, they want to have a reason to excuse their own behavior, they look for a way to find something wrong with Christians. They'll come to me and they'll say, Pastor, do you know what Brother Charlie did? And they'll tell me something Brother Charlie did, but they'll actually be wrong about it. And I'll say, well, actually, I have more information on that. It isn't actually what happened. Here's what actually happened. Here's what you heard. Here's what you saw. And here's what actually happened. Here's the why of it. And they can't find fault. And then they try again. And again. And again. And I'm, just, I'm talking about people who are saved, who are believers, oftentimes looking for a reason to not live for Jesus. And one of the things they do is try to find fault. Listen, they try to find fault with an institution that Christ is well aware is imperfect. This morning in Teen Sunday School, we were talking about the church and the importance of the church. You know something Jesus knows about the church? He knows that she needs to be sanctified so that He can present her to Himself without spot or wrinkle. You know, God is not delusional. And it sounds blasphemous to make that statement, but sometimes in our minds we think God is delusional about the church. I've had people that say, I don't go to church. And I'll say, well, why not? And they'll say, because they're full of hypocrites or something like that. You know how that is. They're, the church is full of hypocrites. And my thought is, yes, they are. Um, the church isn't Jesus. But she's being sanctified by Jesus. In other words, does God know the church is full of hypocrites? By the way, we talked in Sunday school class this morning that if a church is full of humility, it won't be full of hypocrites. If you as a church, if you as a believer come into this place with the same mentality of the publican who smote his breast and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner, you won't come in as a hypocrite. You won't look at someone else and think, I'm here and they are there. You'll come in realizing we're all down here and Jesus is up here. 
And so the church actually, that won't be an actually uh, a true assessment of the church. You bring humility into the church and you won't have hypocrisy. Do you hear me? That's the solution for it. But you know, it's really amazing to me that someone would have the audacity to call someone else a hypocrite. It's incredible to me and yet it's done all the time. As though, as though people are the standard when they need salvation because of sin. Jesus is our standard. Christ is our standard. And let me just throw one more, uh, one more uh, thought your way regarding that. Have you ever noticed when you read the epistles, the letters to the church, that you don't find the Apostle Paul, for instance, telling the church at Corinth, which was an absolute mess. He doesn't say, y'all need to close that place up and go find a good church. Isn't that surprising? There was a man, a Gentile, or a man who had sinned in a way that the Bible says wasn't named among the Gentiles. He's with his father's wife. That's bad. There were people in the church who were suing each other before the law. That's not really good, is it? There were people who were defrauding each other. There were individuals who had made a the matter of the Lord's Supper, which is something that brings us to memory or reminds us about the, blood, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, and they were acting like it was a feast, like it was just a dinner. And that was so bad that God had actually taken the lives of some of them, and some of them were deathly sick. That's bad. And you could go through the letters to the church at Corinth, and you'll see that that was a terrible church. Terrible church. Matter of fact, if I were shopping around, I were looking for a place to worship God, I think I'd move cities. I don't want to go to the church at Corinth, and yet Paul just told the church at Corinth how to get right, how to fix the problems there. You know, we need more of that in the church, don't we? We need more of, you know something, this is scripturally wrong. This is not the way a church ought to be. We need more of, okay, so then let's change. Let's, let's practice sanctification. Let's get right. You know, we need some church changing not so much church leave. Now, I'm not saying that uh, you never leave a church for any Listen, if a church is doctrinally off and it won't get right, then you need to write it. But there, need to be, there needs to be a system in the church where literally believers hold themselves accountable to change the problems, to fix the problems. And what are the problems in the church? It's the people. And so we need to be growing. We need to be becoming more like Jesus. We need to not take offense when sin is preached about. We need not take offense when we're singled out for our particular sin because we're trying to be what Jesus wants us to be, a glorious church presented to Himself without spot or wrinkle. And so in our context, we find that the Pharisees are trying to find fault with Jesus so that they can excuse their unbelief. Now we know that when they can't find fault, they're still not going to believe, right? But they're looking to validate their unbelief. And so the first accusation that they make is about Jesus' disciples. And His disciples were eating on the Sabbath day, and Jesus just emphasized that the Son of Man is the Lord also of the Sabbath. You say, well, Pastor, I don't accept that. I don't think that's a good answer. I do. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. That's the idea. The very notion of the Sabbath and what it was created for, that's a study. We're not going to make that study today, but it is important for us to recognize, first of all, the distinction between the Sabbath and the Lord's Day, first of all. There are, there are people who won't serve the Lord on the Lord's Day. They won't work and get involved in their local church because it'd be work. Because they've mistakenly uh, equated the Sabbath and the Lord's Day as one and the same. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. The Lord's Day is the first day of the week. They're different days in the Scripture. But Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And my friend, living for Jesus is very, very practical. And he's emphasizing that. The second accusation uh, that they made was that Jesus went into their synagogue and He's with them. And they asked the question in verse 10, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? And the reason they asked the question, remember why? That they might accuse Him. So why did they ask, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? so that they could say, you're a sinner. And it's interesting Jesus' response. 
He simply quotes the law. You know what the law says about the oxen being in the ditch. If you read it, they're supposed to know the law. And he said, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on and lift it out? So Jesus emphasizes the difference in value between a man and a sheep. A man and an animal. We could use some of that in our day. Some people have more regard for animals than they do for people. And it's, it's really too bad, isn't it? And I'm not trying to pick on you if you're an animal lover here today. It's a fine thing to be an animal lover. But you ought to love people more than animals. And that's what Jesus is saying. And He's asking for a show of hands. Which one of you? Raise your hand. If your sheep fell in the, in, in the ditch, if you would just leave him in it. If your sheep fell in a pit, which one of you would leave your sheep in that? Well, they valued their sheep. They loved their sheep. And they wouldn't have said, not a single one of them would have said, well, I'll come back tomorrow and get you out of there to their sheep. They wouldn't have done that. And the reason would not even be because of their mercy or their love necessarily, but just because of the value. They're not going to suffer a loss on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said simply that a man is worth more than a sheep. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Don't forget that God knows about the sparrows that fall on the field, and He cares about that, and He cares... He cares immensely more so about you because of your value. And so Jesus is addressing their, their problems with values, and then He just told the guy, He said, stretch forth thine hand. And uh, He stretched it forth, and He was restored whole like as the other. Can you imagine being the guy with the hand, with the withered hand, or the, the, you know, the, with the problem with your hand, and you come in? Maybe they, maybe they made sure He was there on purpose. You know, maybe they said, you know, we're going to set Jesus up. Because we've never seen Jesus see somebody with an infirmity and not heal them. And so we're going to set him up with this. And they had the man with the withered hand come in, and uh, but Jesus healed him. Okay, so that didn't work. Jesus answered them with the Scripture, and He answered them, of course, with the authority of God, because He was God. And that brings us to our context today that I want to look at. I want to look at a characteristic of our Savior that we can imitate. A characteristic of our Savior that we can imitate. And we'll see it here briefly. The Pharisees went out. They held a council against Him how they might destroy Him. Now, let's, let's uh, just talk about things from our perspective versus Jesus' perspective because this really is unusual how Jesus deals with the Pharisees. I personally, and I don't mean to be offensive to you, but I personally believe in preemption. I believe in preemption. You say, Pastor, what's preemption? I mean, if you know somebody's going to do something to you, eliminate the threat before it gets worse. Deal with the threat before it gets worse, right? So the council is trying to destroy Jesus. And have you ever seen, or you ever been, had the experience of having someone who is willing to go to any length to destroy your character, or your reputation, or your actual ministry? Now, what people do can be very, very evil, can it not? And there are individuals that will go to great lengths to assassinate a person's character, and they're trying to assassinate Jesus. If they could have found fault with Jesus in any way, they were willing to do so. And people like that are a problem, and they're very dangerous. I don't want to speak about politics here today, but I'm watching very intently this matter of North Korea right now. It's very interesting what's going on with the assassin in North Korea right now, isn't it? Now, again, I don't want to get political. I don't care if you think that the president's handling things poorly or handling things well. It's interesting to me that a guy on Twitter can get more results than all kinds of pacifism. It's, it's, it's incredible to me. And it seems as though, of course, we have no idea how it's going to shake out. Uh, you know, we may have to... It, it, it could be, this, this thing could, be, could become really crazy right now. Or it could get dealt with. Could be, uh, it could be that Kim Jong-un is actually going to... Um, actually, he probably is in, in great danger from his own people right now, if I had to guess. And it could be that he's going to make a deal so that he can survive from his own people assassinating him. Because I think that's probably the situation... But it's interesting that pacifism has blown him up as far as his ability to do terrible things. Uh, giving him nuclear power plants has helped him to develop nuclear weapons. 
And so that hasn't really helped him. Giving him what he wants or being passive with him hasn't really, hasn't really fixed the problem. And it really seems kind of crazy to think that that would help. You don't cave into threats. And humanly speaking, if the Pharisees, who compare, who are the Pharisees in comparison with God? No. They're nobody. They're nothing. If you're a Pharisee and you are speaking about the Son of God and you're trying to find, you're trying to uh, counsel or decide against the Son of God. If you're a Pharisee and you're doing that and you're Jesus, you know how you'd handle it, and I know how I'd handle it. I, did, I mean, do you think there might have been some dirt on the Pharisees? You might have. You think so? You think there might have been some, some Pharisaical corruption going on? It's interesting in the Acts when the Gospel uh, is, is being preached in the various cities, how that they, they talked about the Jewish Mafia in Acts. They said they suborned men, or they, they hired men of the base, lewd men of the baser sort. Which means what? A bunch of thugs. They, they, they're out hiring thugs to cause riots and blame it on the Christians. You think there might be some, some corruption among the Pharisees? Might there be some collusion with the Roman government and the Pharisees? Might there be a reason they don't want a Savior? Might there be? And so it's time for Jesus to uncover, to expose them, isn't it? Couldn't Jesus... Standing in the middle of the synagogue, rattle off every sin every man there had ever committed. Hey, go dig under Joe. Go, go to Joe's house. Dig underneath his doorstep. Tell me what you find. Hey, follow him. Follow Sam on Tuesday. Watch where he goes. And if you don't believe me, go talk to this lady. Or go talk to this man. And tell him this. And see what they say. You think Jesus could have done that? Might, might he have been able to do so? Yeah. yeah. And he didn't. And he did not. And my friend, it was for a very, very practical example for us, and there's something to be learned here, actually. I'm surprised when I see a statement included in the Scripture, and nothing's in the Scripture by accident. Nothing is in the Scripture for sake of mention, but it doesn't have meaning. I see the Scripture simply say, the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him, and my friend that's there on purpose, it's giving us a snapshot of the character of our Savior. And the Bible says, when Jesus knew it, He withdrew Himself from thence, and great multitudes followed Him, and He healed them all. Jesus' response when the Pharisees sought counsel to destroy Him was to withdraw Himself from them. Remove Himself from them. Now listen to me, will you please? Will you please listen to me here today? It is not in Christ's character, even today, if you're seeking occasion against Him, it's not in His character to follow you and to force you. You know, many times uh, I've realized that the Holy Spirit of God is a gentleman. And the Spirit of God is Christ in us today. And when you are not willing to listen to the Holy Spirit of God and to hear the truth of what the Holy Spirit is saying to you, He's Christ in us. My friend, He's willing to withdraw Himself. Not to be removed out of you or to take away the sealing effect or ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. But my friend, if you don't want to hear from God, He'll leave you alone. You want to seek to undermine or to speak out. It's amazing how individuals will actually say, I want God's will for my life. And when the Scripture plainly says, well, this is, and this is, and this is how you ought to live. I mean, we're not even talking about where to go and what to do. We're just talking about how to live. It's amazing how instantly we begin to accuse God. Well, you know, you have to understand that the Bible is set within a particular culture of the day, you know, and it's Roman culture and it's a pagan culture. No, my friend, the Bible has its own culture. It's called biblical culture. And it reflects the character and nature of God. And oftentimes the Scripture talks about the sins of the day in it, but God never condones the sins of the day. Now, many times when God begins to convict and to deal with us about how we ought to live, we try to seek counsel against him. You say, no, no, it's just, you know, the church, they're just they're hypocrites. And they say you ought to do this and this and this and this and this. And I and I know what the No, no, my friend. 
they're his bride, you see. They belong to Jesus. And when you seek counsel against Jesus, you know what his response is normally? How many of you have ever sinned? You felt like if God did what I deserve, I, he'd just kill me. You ever had a just, God should just kill me moment? I don't know how many times. You, know, you didn't have to raise your hand. Right, I know who you are. I know what you've done. <laughs> God should just kill me moment. I've many times thought, I've even said to God, you know, God, if I were you, I'd kill me. <laughs> I just, you know, I, I, I don't know how else to put it. I say, God, I, I just don't know why you're so merciful. And I'm not, I'm not accusing you in it. I'm thankful for it. But I could understand if you would just say, I'm done with you. Because that's what I deserve. And sometimes I'm kind of being a baby and a, having a little whiny pity party about it. But the fact of the matter is, is that when I fail God, I deserve, I mean, I know better. The, 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 the notion that none of us fail knowingly or that we inadvertently, you know, sin in some kind of an innocent way. No, my friend, when I sin, I'm, I'm guilty. And so are you if you'll be honest about it. And when I do that, when I fail God, man, I just feel like, man, God, you ought to just, you ought to just destroy me. It's amazing how gentle and merciful Jesus is, actually, isn't it? Have you ever just experienced the mercy of God in such a way that it just is not, it's just so opposite? Sometimes you just think, that's just not how I think. That's not what I do. And here we find Jesus having the Pharisees taking counsel against him, how he might destroy them. And the Bible says He withdrew Himself from them. Now you ask the question, Pastor, why did Jesus withdraw Himself? Was it because His kingdom wasn't of this world, and if it were of this world, then His servants would fight? Was it because He came to seek and to save that which is lost, and it wasn't His ministry at the time? No, there's something deeper than that. There's something deeper than that. Let's look at the quote of Isaiah chapter 42. The Bible says in verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Notice verse 19. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now stop here, and uh, this is, a, this is a, just a, a very, very exact quote uh, of Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 3. Matter of fact, I'll just read it to you, beginning the second part of verse 42. You don't need, or verse 1 of chapter 42. You don't need to turn there because it's almost identical in your Bible. Read how, how exact it's, it's translated. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Now, the, the order of the words is somewhat different, but the words that are there, exactly, it's an exact quote of the Scripture. Now, what is, what is the Scripture saying about Jesus? How many of you all uh, remember the Coleman Lanterns? Anybody here remember Coleman Lanterns? Do they, do they, yeah, they still sell them. Does anybody here have an actual Coleman Lantern, like a kerosene lantern or all the different fuels that they use? Anybody here still actually have one? Chuck, you have one? Joel has one? Yeah, I've got one somewhere. Okay, but you remember, remember the uh, Achilles heel of the Coleman Lantern? You know, what's, what's the weakness of the Coleman Lantern? How many of y'all let the kids carry the Coleman Lantern when you're going to camp? There are two weaknesses, right, in the Coleman Lantern. One is the glass mantle. I, I have seen those break before. I'm not going to say how or where. But the real problem is the wick. Remember the wick? And when they did, did they used to, you know, pull the, they would pull the glass up and then, you know, reach in and light the wick. And they'd always say, don't touch the wick with the match. You know what I'm talking What happens if, you ever been told not to touch something? Like, never touch the wick with the match. If you don't tell somebody why, it's not always bad to explain why. I remember being t uh, being a child. The first time I touched touched a hot stove, I was uh, almost four. I was about three and a half, and I remember very very distinctly being in the kitchen in our farmhouse and watching the hot stove glowing red. My mom was making hot chocolate on a pan in the winter time, you know, making it on the stove top out of milk and 
cocoa and sugar and you know the way moms in on farm in the farm know how to make hot chocolate after you've been playing in the snow. She's making hot chocolate. And I remember the stove burner, I've always been fascinated by how things work anyway. It's glowing bright red and she turned it off and really quickly you watch black kind of go like this around the spiral in the stove and it turned black and I thought okay now it's cool and I touched it. And I found out black is not cool. <laughs> That does not mean that it is not uh, that it won't burn you. And I burned it. My mom said, "You should never touch the stove." I told you, never touch the stove when it's hot. Well, it didn't look hot because it wasn't glowing red, but it still was hot, and it burned me. Now, um, you ever touch a wick on a Coleman lantern? What happens? It's like it. You don't even feel it. Like you can just put your finger through. It's like it's not there. You ever thrown a newspaper on a fire and watched it burn? You can still read the letters on it. Like it's actually, the paper's actually burned, but it's still there. It's just like, and then if you just touch it, what's it do? It just disintegrates. It just falls apart. Isaiah prophesied that our Savior would not go in the streets and cry out. He wouldn't be screaming and yelling in the streets. He wouldn't be saying, come on, bring your accusations and I'll bring mine against you. He wouldn't be lifting up His voice. He wouldn't be a cantankerous, uh, vociferous Savior. Matter of fact, you really only have one instance where Jesus is very emphatic in any of His ministry. He has a very withdrawn ministry normally, doesn't He? He goes into the temple and He cleared clean house. Because it was his house. And he said, Make my mine house, you know, you've made my house a den of thieves. He drove out the money changers. But for the most part, the ministry of the Lord Jesus is a withdrawing ministry. Of course, he when he taught his disciples, he went up into the mountain and they came unto him and he taught them. Here he's in the synagogue and they they're trying to set him up, and they said, you know, what are you going to do about the man on the Sabbath day? And he healed the man. And then they took counsel to slay him, and he retreated from them. He withdrew himself from them. Instead of being preemptive, instead of going after them and seeking to destroy the people who were in the wrong, who were wicked, who deserved judgment, Jesus' attitude toward the wicked was that a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. And literally, it, it, the idea is, is, is of a branch that's fallen over, that's broken, and all it would take would be just a tap for the thing to separate and be broken. All it would take would be literally for a smoking flax just to be touched, and it would just disintegrate to nothing and be gone. And here we find a great picture. See, the picture here is who in our context, who in our context are the bruised reed and the smoking flax? Who? The Pharisees are. Listen to me, friend, and get this because it's so vitally important. Unbelievers are a touch away from destruction. Do you hear me? Unbelievers are a touch away from destruction. They literally, at God's touch, Breathe or stop breathing. The Bible says it's appointed unto man who wants to die. After this, the judgment. Who's in charge of the appointment? God is. Now you think that God is somehow threatened by the railings of accusers, my friend. If you think that Christ is somehow, His ministry or His validity is somehow uh, going to be uh, undermined because of the accusations of unbelievers, you're very mistaken about God and who He is. See, Jesus has nothing to prove, my friend. He's God. And whatever accusations they bring against Him are going to be false. And they have no bearing on the reason, the purpose, why He came. And He came so that He could have mercy on the, bru on the broken reed and the bruised flax. Or the smoking flax. The bruised reed and the smoking flax. Isn't that amazing? Actually, why did Jesus withdraw Himself from the Pharisees? So He wouldn't have to destroy them. And that's kind of incredible, isn't it? Because if it's me, I say, Jesus, it's about time to just deal with these guys. They're not going to believe. 
These guys are worthless. They are not going to believe. And yet it is in the character of our Savior to withdraw Himself so that He does not have to deal with them in a final manner. You say, Pastor, well, if they're not going to believe anyway. No, see, that's the thing. Jesus knows things that you and I don't know about people. Do you ever think about the audience on the day of Pentecost when the Gospel was preached by Peter and the rest of the apostles in the tongues of the, uh, in the languages of the people that were there? Do you ever think about who that audience was specifically? When the Bible says when they heard this at the end of Peter's message, they were pricked to their heart. What did Peter just said? This same Jesus whom ye have crucified, God hath made Him both Lord and Christ. You know the Jesus last week that you were dancing around the cross yelling crucify Him about? God's raising from the dead. He's Lord and Christ. And the Bible says when they heard this, they were pricked to the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And then he talks about Joel, the promise of the pro or he talked before that the prophecy of Joel, the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are far off. In other words, the bruised reed, the smoking flax, that railed against the Son of God and said, Crucify him, that said, Give us Barabbas. We'd rather have a treasonous murderer released than the innocent Son of God. Those same individuals, because of the power of the cross and the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God, actually came to God in belief. Do you ever think about the injustice of Stephen, the first martyr in the church? Do you ever read about how that individual who for simply preaching the Gospel to those people who railed against God was stoned to death? And Saul stood there consenting unto his death. And then after that, breathed out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And he desired, went to the high priest and desired letters so that he could go to different cities, in particular Damascus, and bind people and bring them back and throw them in prison and kill them. And Jesus met him on the road and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then do you remember your unbelief? Do you remember the first you say, uh, Pastor, you know if a person rejects Jesus one time. No, my friend, not believing in Jesus is, is a lifelong rejection. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 18, that he that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed. See, you're born in unbelief. The first moment that you come to understand that you ought to bow before Jesus and receive Christ as your Savior, my friend, you're in unbelief. And for some, that's the first time that we understand and we get saved. I think probably the first time I really understood that I was a sinner, I trusted Christ. I received Him as my Savior. Thank God for that. But you know, I know people that have heard the Gospel and heard the Gospel and heard the Gospel and heard the Gospel and heard the Gospel. And, the gospel. and then one day they get saved. And I'm telling you, until the moment they get saved, they are a bruised reed and a smoking flax. That's not threatened by your unbelief. If you think that somehow by not believing, you're going to show God something, my friend. God is showing you mercy. Do you hear me? God's response to your seeking counsel to destroy Him, if you will, is to show you mercy. And if you're here today and you have breath, and you have your mind, and you have the ability to make decisions to receive Jesus or reject Jesus, it's because God loves you and God is showing you mercy. And that's the kind of Savior the Bible prophesied would come. And be the Savior of the Gentiles as well. That's the second thing I was going to look at today. We don't have time. What I want us to leave here today with, I think from the context, is an understanding of the kind of Savior Jesus is. What kind of a Savior is He? Well, He's the kind of Savior that doesn't take counsel to destroy those that take counsel to destroy Him. You ever wonder why God allows atheists? You ever wonder that? You ever hear the things they say against God and the plotting and the scheming and literally how they devote their lives to trying to undermine God's plan? Trying to undermine God's people that have faith in God? And literally spend their lives attacking God? You ever wonder why God just doesn't snuff them out? 
Listen, they're a smoking flax. He could touch them and they'd disintegrate. God's not threatened by them. But my friend, God is a merciful God who doesn't want to destroy anyone. I love the... And I'll finish with this. I love the perspective Peter gives when he deals with the accusation that in his day people were making against God and His mercy. Remember this? When they would say, you know, where's God basically from the foundations of 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, you know, from the time that God created the earth, all things continue as they are till now. Basically, if God's good, why doesn't He destroy the wicked? And Peter says, Fear, fearful, fiery judgment is going to be coming and God's going to destroy utterly. But before that, he said, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us work, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And my friend, you ask the question, if God is really God, why hasn't He destroyed me? Because you're a bruised reed and a smoking flax. And it's not in His character and His nature. Oh, one day God will deal with, with those who have sealed their rebellion, with those who have finally said, I will not believe. God knows when that is for you as well. But you know the way God sees you when you threaten and when you, uh, when you rebel against Him and when you rail against Him and accuse Him. You know the way God sees you. He sees you like the wick on a Coleman lantern that the slightest touch will destroy. He sees you as fragile. And He sees you as needing to be protected rather than destroyed. And my friend, that is just polar opposite of the way that I think. Isn't it opposite of how you think? And yet it is a glimpse into the character of our Savior. Okay, so what do we do with this? How do we take it? Well, first of all, I think it's important for us to understand how God sees us, isn't it? So that's the first area of application today. If God sees us this way as fragile and as easily be destroyed, to be easy to be destroyed, why then does He not destroy us? Because He loves us. And so, friend, you can count that the long suffering of God is mercy. You can count that God being patient with you. It's because He's merciful to you. And it's a demonstration of the fact that He personally loves you. And then, my friend, the second area of application is that you can reflect the character of God. Hell's real, isn't it? Judgment, damnation, it's real, isn't it? It's going to happen someday, will it not? Is that the message of the cross? Is that the message of the cross? It's the reality without the cross. And truth is truth and ought to be proclaimed, oughtn't it? But how is it the message of the cross to scream that people are going to go to hell and that God hates them? <coughs> how is that the message of the cross, my friend? Is that the message of Christ? You know, some individuals think that they're being bold or they're standing up for God or for Jesus by screaming hatred toward the wicked. Jesus' response to the wicked is, don't, don't kill them. Why is that? Well, some of us here today can testify because sometimes the wicked turn to Jesus. See, that's us, isn't it? Uh, you know, so many of us today, if you were to testify, you'd stand up and say, if people were to describe me before I received Jesus as my Savior, they would have said, never! That man will never darken the doors of a church. That man will never trust Jesus as his Savior. She'll never change. <laughs> but a merciful Savior who will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoking flax, my friend, can break a heart of stone with his love. That is the love of Christ. All kinds of nonsense preached about the love of Christ, but this is the love of Christ. And this is God's mercy towards you. And my friend, if anything in the world ought to be clearly understood by His disciples, and we ought to be His disciples, it ought to be to understand how important it is to preach the gospel the way Jesus does. Listen, how much are you threatened by the wicked? What can the wicked do to you? We saw a couple, uh, we saw in chapter 10 that we're not supposed to fear those that can destroy the body, right? But we're to fear the one who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. Who's that? Jesus. Are you supposed to be fearful of the wicked? You're supposed to live in fear of what wicked men can do to you. Might wicked men do terrible things? Might terrible things happen to you and you're perfectly innocent? Yeah, absolutely. And you know something? You'll be alright because they're a smoking flax. 
they are a bruised reed. And you and I need to be careful not to give offense to the wicked. To take counsel to destroy them because they've taken counsel against Jesus. Jesus is going to be alright. See, He's God. He doesn't need to defend Himself. He doesn't need to stop evil. My friend, His desire is to save to the uttermost all them that call upon Him. And the only kind of people that call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved are wicked people. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? The only kind of people God saves are wicked ones. So today, let me ask you a final question. Are you born again? Do you know Jesus as your Savior? There's no question about God loving you. And you could have all kinds of accusations. And your, your response to God's love could be, if God's real, then why hasn't He done something about me? Because you're a bruised reed and you're a smoking flax and Jesus is a merciful Savior. Is that good enough for you? Is that enough? You say, Pastor, I don't know about... Listen, my friend. The Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Even them that believe on His name. Try Jesus. Trust Him as your Savior. and You'll get to know a Savior that's so merciful. All God's in control. You read the revelation of the Scripture. You're going to see God's going to finally judge all the wicked. It's a foregone conclusion. But the question is, what about you? Will you receive His mercy? The second question this morning is this. What gospel do you preach? What kind of a Savior do you have? Do you have a kind of Savior? Are you preaching a Savior who is here to destroy the wicked or a Savior who died on the cross for sinners? What's your gospel? What gospel do you preach? So it isn't some kind of a contrast. Jesus is God. Jesus is a righteous judge. And judgment's a foregone conclusion, but God's desire is to save to the uttermost all them that call upon Him. What gospel do you preach? Father, thank You for what we've learned this morning. And Lord, in many ways, Your character is such a contrast from ours that it brings us to a place of great conviction. We recognize, Lord, we are so unmerciful when we have a Savior who is so full of mercy and loving kindness. God, we're so unloving, and yet you are the exact opposite of that. And as your children, we ought to reflect your character. So, Lord, this prophecy of the Scripture that we see explain why it is that you allowed the Pharisees to behave the way that they did. Lord, not only does that fulfill prophecy, but it gives us an insight into the kind of a Savior that you are. And I have to say today, I thank you for being a merciful Savior. That's what I need. I need a merciful Savior. God, I pray that if there's a person here today that's not born again, that they'd say that they need a merciful Savior. God, I pray for any person here today who preaches an unmerciful gospel. Lord, they'd see your character, see who you are, and see why this is included in the Scripture for us to understand. Lord, I pray that you would teach us to preach a merciful gospel. Before I finish my prayer this morning, I want to ask each person here, out of respect for everyone else, just to keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. And the reason for that would be that you, you need a private a moment of privacy and so does everyone else. And so if you would respect everyone by not looking around, I want to ask a couple private questions just between you and God and with me as a witness so that I can help you here today. I wouldn't embarrass you for anything. But if you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Price, I see that a God who loves sinners is a loving God. And I see that a Christ who desires to save sinners rather than judge the wicked by taking their own judgment, their judgment upon Himself. I see that, that Jesus is a merciful Savior and I've never received Him. That's never become personal to me. I've never trusted Jesus as my Savior. If I were to die today, I do not know that I have eternal life and that's something that's a matter of concern right now. If Jesus is a merciful Savior, I want to receive His mercy. I'm not born again. I don't know that I have eternal life. But I need to, Pastor, don't call me out, don't embarrass me, but will you pray for me? I, God is dealing with me about this matter of my need for eternal life. Would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up, would you please? Just slip it up and I'll see it and slip it right back down. Okay, second question this morning. Pastor, it goes without saying that all of us fall short of Christ and His example. But regarding the matter of the Gospel and the matter of who Christ is, this matter of Christ's long-suffering and His mercy and His character has been something I've overlooked. And 
the way that I preach the gospel sometimes, the way that I present Christ to people, oftentimes I present Him as a God who isn't merciful, as a God who isn't gentle. And God's dealt with me about that, and as, as the Lord helps me, I want to reflect Christ in this matter that we've seen in His character today. Pray for me, Pastor. Don't call me out. Don't embarrass me. Pray for me. God's shown me an area in, in this passage this morning that I want to reflect Christ. Just slip your hand up if that's you. Just slip, yep, slip right back down. Okay? I want to reflect Christ in this matter. Here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to give us about a, a minute. And why don't you just tell God what you told me and allow God's Holy Spirit to work on your heart. If you needed to, if you needed to slip out and have someone pray with you, uh, it probably wouldn't be necessary to do so during the invitation time this morning because I'll be available after the service and I don't want to embarrass anybody or call anyone out. But if God spoke in your heart and you need to do business with Him, let's just have a moment and you could pray and tell Him what, you're, uh, or what you've just said to me by raising your hand and then I'll pray and I'll pray for you after that. God, I thank You for loving us. And God, Your mercy always amazes me. Your long-suffering is always something that because of my sinful, my sinful character and nature that oftentimes I can't relate to. And yet the Scripture so plainly teaches such a clear truth about our Savior. And God, I want to preach that Gospel. I want to preach a Gospel that accurately and fairly depicts Jesus. And so I pray for those who have not received Jesus. Lord, I just thank You for Your mercy to them. And I ask that they would see their need for salvation. And that You would help us through preaching the cross of Jesus Christ to help people see their need for a merciful Savior. And God, this is the kind of Savior we need. We don't need a Savior that reflects our sinful characteristics and tendencies. And our desire to have revenge for our own sake. When God, You're willing to forgive sinners at your own expense. Thank you for Jesus and the cross, and I pray that you would help us to absorb these truths and to live them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much this morning for being here, for your careful attention. I realize I've preached a long time today. won't always do that, but sometimes I do, and I appreciate your being patient with that. Try not to make promises about how long I'll preach, because I think that kind of restricts uh, the work of the Lord sometimes and what God wants to accomplish. If I can be of a help or service to you anyway, I want you to know that I count it a privilege to have the opportunity to do that. I'm available. If you've ever called me at any hour, you'll know that I try very hard to answer my phone. And so I'm always available if you'd like to call. And if, I, if you have a personal need or something that I can help you with as a pastor, I would count it my privilege to do so. And we invite you to be back here this evening. We'll be having one of our uh, final messages on good examples of bad examples in our 6 p.m. service. And God bless you. You're dismissed.